Praise God. Praise God. Um, greetings from Ghana. And may grace and peace from the Father God and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Um, what I'm going to do today is that I'm not going to preach. I'm going to share with you how we grow our churches in Ghana and the rest of the world. And then you try to pick something from it. It will not be the same for you here because of different environment. But as I share it, you can also pick something from it. And then if there's an opportunity, you can interact with me if you want to know more about the issues. But I'll let us read Acts 1, 8. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8. I'm reading it from the Good News Bible. Good News Bible. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power. And you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power. And you will be witnesses for me, beginning from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the world. Yeah, this is a key verse for our way of evangelism or witnessing. So I come from a church called the Church of Pentecost. As you've already been informed, we are in uh, 86 uh, countries and in all the continents. But it started very small in Ghana. What we do is that we have a local church. A church begins when we have more than 12 people. That is our way of def def uh, defining a church. If it is less than 12, you may take it as life, um, as a life group. But if it is above 12, we can make it a church. Now, if a church grows up to a certain standard, depending upon the town, or the environment, the city, or the suburb. If it is within a city and in a suburb, when it grows, sometimes up to 100, we can divide it. Up to uh, uh, 200, we can divide it. Up to 500 or even 1,000, we can divide it. Now, a church is in the possession of a presbytery. The presbytery comprises deacons and deaconesses and then elders. So a church may not have a pastor, an ordained pastor. But then it would have a group of elders, let's say five elders. Out of the five elders, one will become the presiding elder. The presiding elder is like the local pastor of the church. The pastor oversees a number of churches, maybe three, four, and in a very uh, obscure situation, 10, 10 churches, a pastor. But how can a pastor take charge of 10 churches? You know, the pastor does that through the presbytery of the local church. So now the pastor will occasionally organize leadership training for the elders, deacons, and deaconesses, then train them to be able to do church in a substance. So the presiding elder would do a church like a pastor does. He will be the pastor in charge of the local church. Now, when a church grows, let's say, up to 200, and a member who comes from another village or another uh, suburb sees that, no, where I come from to the church is too far, the member will begin, he will inform the pastor about it, then he will begin to have a prayer meeting in his house or her house. And then inform the pastor that my place is too far from the central church. I would like a church to be planted here. So within the local church, 
the pastor would organize something like a rally, open air service, and then look through the church and find people whose uh, homes are closer to that place. And then he would recommend to the people that they should all come together for them to start a church in that village or suburb. So to begin with, the pastor would organize an open air service or a rally, uh, organize the rally there, conduct the rally for about three or four days. Then after that, before that, they will look for a place of worship, a place of worship. So immediately after the, immediately after the open air service, then the presiding elder, the pastor would appoint one of the elders to oversee that church and then report to the pastor. Then the local church that started that church will begin to support the church for about six months. After six months, that new church is supposed to be able to continue to support themselves through the giving of tithes and the giving of offerings from the members. So that is how the church is being done. And you realize that people begin to share their faith wherever they are. Once he works with somebody, once he travels, you begin to share the faith with another person. And in case he shares a testimony, he witnesses to somebody, and the person has a need, that member will pray for the person who has a need. And when that prayer is said for the person, God intervenes. And when the Lord intervenes, then they realize that, yes, the God we serve is very, very real, and we will like to uh, join your church. And if he joins the church, and he realizes that, no, my place too is too far, then he will also request. <laughs> yeah. He or she too requests that a church is planted there. And then the same process will be followed, and the church follows up in that area. And that is how the church spread to other parts of West Africa. Some of our members, in fact, uh, Ghanaians migrate a lot. So some of our members went to the neighborhood like Togo, Nigeria, um, Burkina Faso, La Côte d'Ivoire, uh, that is uh, Ivory Coast. So when they went there too, they also began to share their faith. And when they shared their faith, they started a prayer meeting, and then when they realized that people were coming, messages were sent to the headquarters. And when a message is sent to the headquarters, the headquarters will sit down and send the pastor. I happened to be the first international missions director of the church. As the international missions director, my job was to follow up such messages. So when a message was sent to us, then the international missions director would visit. When the, the international missions director visits, look at the people who are there, have a dialogue with them, and then let them know the, what they want. If they say that they want a pastor, then you begin to dialogue with them. How are you going to take charge of the pastor? So you decide, well, the headquarters will try to support you for maybe six months. After six months, it is expected that you be faithful to God and give your tithes. You should be able to give your tithes to the Lord and give offerings so that after six months, you should be able to pay for the pastor, the salary, the international missions director will work the salary with them. Then you should be able to pay for the accommodation. Um, so you work out the accommodation for them and then you plan, you, he needs a vehicle. Uh, you may assist them to buy the first vehicle. And then after that, you should be able to service and continue to buy a vehicle for the people. So through that, churches were established in our neighborhood, West Africa. And then our people migrated to the West. And when they went to the West too, similar uh, situation followed. Uh, so now we are in many countries in the West, in Europe, in, in America. And then when it went there to the church began to grow, the people were giving. They were giving their tithes, giving 
offerings, and they also started supporting our missions in many, many, many areas. Now, when you have a local church, the presiding elder is in charge of the local church. And then when you have two or three uh, churches, the pastor takes charge of these churches. So he becomes what we call a district pastor, an overseer who oversees those churches. He is the one who organizes training for them. Then when we have more pastors, then we have one of the pastors who becomes an area head. The area head would supervise about three, four, ten, and sometimes up to 20 pastors. Now, at the end of every year, the local church will do their own local presbytery meeting and bring their annual report. Then, after that, the pastor would also organize an end-of-year meeting where all the officers there would meet, and then the local churches present their annual uh, report to the district pastor. Then the district pastor would compile a report and send it to an area meeting where pastors, the pastors together with representative elders would meet. And then the district pastors will present their report. Um, after everything, then the areas would also um, meet and then com the area head will com compile his report and then send it to what we call the general council meeting, where uh, as of now, I am the chairman for the church, so I'm the chairman of the general council. All the various nations would bring their report, and then the various areas will bring their report. The report is analyzed. And then when you have a query, you like to find out what happened here. How did you perform? How many new converts were baptized? How many new churches were planted? You would have to account for all of these things. So the report is first of all sent to the chairman. The chairman would have to analyze through his office and compile all and then send queries, responses to uh, queries to the various nations and the various areas. Then the area head would have to go through the queries and answer. So when we meet at the general council, all these responses are supposed to be answered there. And uh, it is there that we have to do everything. The people become faithful to the point that some individuals are able to put up church buildings for new churches that come out. I think about three years ago, uh, we had six people from the churches who were able to, if I say six people, couples, six couples, who were able to put up churches for new churches that were planted. They said that, well, if the Lord has blessed us to be able to begin a new church at such a place, then we, because we are blessed, you will be able to put up a church building. We have six couples uh, putting up church buildings out of their own resources, out of their own resources. And that was a very big blessing for uh, the church. Then again, when there is an issue coming out, um, the local would have to settle it. If the local presbytery is not able to do it, then the local presbytery would send it to the pastor. If the pastor is not able to settle it, it will go to the area head. And if the area head is not able to send it, finally, it will go to the chairman who would have to see to it and settle the issue. So that is our way of uh, grievances. So roughly, this is the setup, and this is how churches are done. We also do lots of uh, personal evangelism. Personal evangelism. We've got a movement called Evangelism Ministry. And the task of the Evangelism Ministry 
is to evangelize. So when they meet, they teach one another of how to evangelize. And they do most of the rallies and campaigns and also show people how to do personal evangelism and begin a church. And then we have also got mission committees, mission committees. Within every area, we have a committee that is in charge of missions. They try to encourage people to give out, to support missions. We have people who give out money at the end of every month to support missions. Uh, individually, they have made a promise to give to missions at the end of every month. Then beside that, the church would have to do a general offering for missions at every month. This is different from the normal offerings that we give to the church. We give our tithes <clears throat> and offerings to the church. This one is different from it. But special offerings for missions. We see that people sometimes donate vehicles that we would like to donate a vehicle to a missions. And we've got two types of missions. We've got the internal missions and then the international missions. When we come to the internal missions, within Ghana, we've got some areas that are less endowed with resources. So those areas are called internal missions. And then um, we try to support them with church buildings. We try to give special allowances to people who are working there. And um, we try also to give them motor bicycles. And sometimes we have individuals who begin to give support to such internal missions. And then outside that one, we have international missions. And then international missions too. The international missions is supposed to take care of itself. But there are, other, there are some countries that cannot take care of themselves, themselves within Africa, some in South America. And we try to support all those ones from our international missions fund. And here, too, we see individual supporting. Uh, it is surprising that sometimes when I am traveling as the chairman of the church, some of the people who are endowed in the churches, in the church of Pentecost, come to see me, me the chairman. If you go and see a need, come and tell us, you'll be able to support them. And we have some of them donating to support them. And some give me some amount. They tell me that you'll be able to give maybe $8,000, $10,000, or $15,000. If you go and see a need, uh, you can decide to tell us, and we give the money to them. So this is how missions is done in our area. And through that, the Lord continues to bless the church and continues to bless individuals. So I'll pause here. And if you would like to ask a question to know about uh, more about it, you can do so. Thank you. So I pause here for interaction. <laughs> yes. Yeah, if you have any question. <laughs> yes. Is there any hand I have not seen? <laughs> Yes. If there's something you would like to know more about how we grow our churches. Otherwise, Pastor, yeah, this briefly, unless you like me to. <laughs> perhaps, uh, uh, Professor Oninda, perhaps you could address our people. One of the issues that they have as lay people to serve is the issue of uh, time, because they are working, they got families. But we hear from your your model of church planting and how you grow the ministries. The people are very devoted. They, they give a lot of their time. Mm. These are lay people. They are not full time. 
Um, so how they manage their yes, time. Yes, how do they do that? Yeah, all right. I think that's a very important uh, question. Sometimes we are surprised of how people are committed, especially the lay officers. We have some who are doctors, yet they are able to work out their time in such a way that some of the doctors are presiding elders. So they, they work it in such a way that they would be able to come to church and preside over, over a church. Um, commitment in the, in the towns, in the cities, sometimes there are traffic jam. I don't know how the traffic jam is here, but yeah, I, in our place is very, very, very um, um, strong. The traffic jam is, I can say, maybe more than it is here, because you are developed, more developed than Ghana. You've been able to put up very good road network. We are rather doing it. However, you get doc doctors who would manage their time and then be able to come and preside a local assembly like a pastor. Yet, they do it voluntarily. They vol voluntarily. And this is how we identify pastors. If we see a young man who is doing evangelism and who is very much interested in sharing a church, leading prayer sessions, and he feels the call, he can tell his pastor. On the other hand, if the pastor sees that, I sense the call of God in, in your life, he can tell him to pray about it. And once he is also, he agrees with the pastor, sometimes one of these smaller churches is given to him to pastor to see of his ability. And then he's eventually recommended by the local church to the district. A committee will be set up to assess him. And then if they agree, they send him to the, the ministerial, what we call the National Ministerial Committee. It is from there that he will go to Bible College. So there we identify a call in the person before he comes to the Bible college and train and eventually take over a church. But the members commit their time first to the church. So you preside for two years. After two years, you'll be reviewed. If you like to continue, you continue. Uh, once you agree to continue to preside, you'll do so. But after a certain number, another person, a number of years, another person will take over as a presiding elder. So lay people managing their time and so presiding. And it works along uh, in other countries, in the, in the Western world. That is how it is done too. You go there, people are very busy, but they still manage their own time and preside a church. <laughs> so Pastor, it sounds like um, the commitment is required there and the management of time is required there. But sometimes we, we run into conflicts with family members because we, we are busy at work and then we give time to, to ministry. Sometimes the spouse or the children may, may feel neglected. I'm sure you have such situations in your churches. How do you resolve uh, that for it? Yeah, being a family member myself. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a family member. Yes, um, the family understands the situation so that the wife also commits herself to whatever you are doing. And the children also commit themselves in whatever you are doing. So they become part of the ministry. And the wife will know that once my husband is doing this, I should support him. So it's not, it's not a matter of a conflict between the wife and the husband. The wife agrees that, well, both of us have been, have been called to the ministry. And if this is what God has endowed you with, I should support. And um, the, the children also come to agree. So the family become the church. They are part of the church, and then they support. If the man is the minister, they support the man, uh, commit themselves to whatever the man is doing. And some of them do it in joy. Just last week, I had a couple from the United States of America who 
decided to plant, to put up a church building, to put up a church building in the northern part of Ghana. That is the less endowed area. So they came from USC just to come and see the church building dedicated. And um, I was not able to attend it because of a national commitment at that time. So after that, they had to pay a visit. I had to encourage them, express my thanks to them, had a picture with them. And the whole thing started from the wife, interestingly. The wife saw a clip and he said, well, if God has blessed us, um, though we did not have enough money, we can begin to, to put up a church building for this village. So the wife initiated everything, and they started gradually. And God also blessed them. So eventually, I think about two or three years, they were able to put up that church building. A commitment from the family members. Yes. <laughs> and it, yes. OK. Uh, uh, as I listen to you carefully, uh, it seems like it's easy to plant the church. OK. But uh, as a chairman, is there any checklist or main condition to accept when someone is coming with the need to plant a church? Right, yes, the, the initial thing is that it begins from the local church. And three or four churches may come together to form a district where there is a pastor. So if someone wants to begin a church, it will come to that, the pastor. The pastor would have to go to the location the, that location, and then make a survey, finds a place of worship. So after that, then the pastor may begin with an open, open air church, an uh, open air service. So it wouldn't come to the chairman. The chairman would have too many things to do at that time, but he has delegated the pastor there to take charge. So once the pastor goes and make initial survey and realizes that indeed a church is necessary here, then he will see to it and organize it. At the end of the year, he will report to his supervisor, who is the area head. And then it will also come to the supervisor's annual report. So through the annual report, the chairman will know that uh, he will know the number of churches that have been planted in the denomination, if you put it that way, within a year. I don't know whether I've made myself clear. So the pastor would have to do the initial work and confirm that, yes, we need to begin a, ch a church here. He does it. He reports to his superintendent, and then the, sup the superintendent will report to the general council. That is through the chairman. <laughs> All right. Any other um, question? Yes. How long does it take to train? Yeah, we train pastors for two years. We have one, uh, the two years is compulsory. We have one year intensive one, and then after the one year intensive, you are released to a district. And then you do the second year through um, a school of education. In other words, extension. You come for two weeks, um, go back. Then another man, another, after two months, you come for another two weeks until you finish the curriculum. Yeah, so that is for everybody. After that one, those who have the ability to do the degree are also allowed to do it through school, uh, through extension program, through extension program. Only few people have the opportunity to do it straight ahead for a degree, which lasts for three years. Yes. Uh, prof yeah. Professor, sometimes we, we serve in a ministry, and we've done it for many years, but we don't seem to be able to multiply or to grow or to see any breakthrough. What would you recommend? To, to such people? Yeah, we, we have a system of evaluation. 
So if yours is evaluated that you are not being successful in one place, sometimes you'll be transferred. <laughs> yeah. You will be transferred to another church, and another person would be asked to come and take over. And surprisingly, sometimes when someone changes to another place, he becomes fruitful there. <laughs> but yes, and when a different person comes, he becomes fruitful. There is a very typical example. One church was going to be closed down because it was not growing, and we decided to change the pastor. When the pastor was changed and another person came in, it started growing. Eventually, that place became an area, a very big church that we had to divide, and now many other pastors are under a senior pastor, a superintendent there, but it was going to be closed down. So, <laughs> so if it is not growing, you would have to find out whether it is true the pastor who is there, or maybe his ministry is different from the area where he is. <laughs> yes. Professor, it sounds very, very challenging to me. Would you say that uh, it would be the highlight of a person's life to have been able to be part of planting a church is that something that you would put into the hearts of your people? Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if you yeah. could invest your life and see a church planted? Would that be right in saying that? Yes, all right, yes. From the quotation I read, you know, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost part of the world. So people believe that once the Holy Spirit is in me, I should be able, I have received power. And the power should enable me to witness about Christ. This is key to our church planting. So people, once people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, they believe that the power is there. And once the power is there, he should be able to share, he or she should be able to share his or her faith with another person. I think this is the trust of the matter. And I quite remember that when I accepted Christ initially, and I went to a place and began to share my faith with about four people, we went out and started doing evangelism, something that is common in Ghana. Sharing the faith, trying to let the people know that, yes, once there is this power, witches, demons cannot kill you. You have power over demons. You should not be afraid of that. And once you come to Jesus, he is able to protect you from sorcery, from all sorts of demonic powers and principality. And I think the reception of the Holy Spirit uh, enables people to go about evangelism. And the stress is made here. When you come to that evangelism uh, uh, ministry too, people are encouraged that you can do it. Therefore, you have to go out and do it. That becomes a key. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yes, I'm expecting something from the young people too. <laughs> I began as a young man. I was getting to 18 years old when I accepted Christ. And that was when I started sharing my faith with people, praying for people, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then establishing fellowship, and then planting churches. The senior pastor said that, Opoku, I've seen the call of God in your life. And then I only worked for two years, and then he taught me, he would travel with me, and then eventually asked me to take charge of a district, a church that was having about four uh, church, a district that was having four local churches. So that is how it started. Uh, and I was 22 years old, one year older than your senior pastor <laughs> when he started the ministry. Yes, that is how. But as a young man, the fire was burning, and then I went out. So I expect that many young people too will catch the fire and begin to do the same job. <laughs> yes. 
Yes. Hi, Pastor. Um, since you're addressing young people and young, young men, right? So what is your youth like in church? Like how big is your youth or is your churches mostly comprising of young people? And if so, how is discipleship done in your church as well? Or do you guys have a systematic, structured way of doing discipleship? Or, yeah, just your thoughts and your All experience. right, thank you very much. The church comprises roughly 70% youth and children. So the adult, about 30%. And we thank God for that. That means it has a future. We have youth ministry that is headed by a director. A director is a senior minister um, who takes charge of that. And then within every area too, we also have a leader who is in charge of youth and a leader who is in charge of children. It gets down to the district level, you have seen, and then the local level. So we have a series of meetings studies and programs for the young uh, people. And then we embody them into the leadership. When it comes to our general council too, we have the youth representative in the general council meeting. Then we have got youth uh, pastors, who pastors in the universities and the secondary uh, institutions. We've got uh, youth pastors who are in charge of that. And then also we've got a ministry of discipleship. We have lay leadership and also discipleship uh, uh, um, committee. Uh, it's, it's a sort of ministry with another person in charge and they would have to um, write, design, um, a discipleship manual and cell meeting, which is life group uh, uh, material for the churches to use. So um, they will produce it every six months, uh, depending upon our focus for the year. They would gather people together, write, go through, and send it to the churches. So the discipleship training too is very, very strong. And it's linked with the youth, linked with the youth. And the youth ministry tries to come out with devotional book at, uh, every year uh, 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 with the focus of touching the needs of the youth. So all these things coming together encourage the youth a lot. And I see that the youth are very much interested and, and they are growing in the church. Yes. <laughs> All right, so thank you for that question. Yes. Is there any other one? Yeah, yeah. one here, okay. sorry. Um, can I just want to know, curious in terms of the structure of the youth program and as well as um, in terms of implementing a youth program in your church, um, how does the approval process go and in, this, in this situation? How, the question I got, how is the youth program process? Yes. All right, yes. And how do you implement it how do you in implement your church? It? Right. Yeah, we have the youth ministry at the national level. And then when you come to the area level, there is a similar one. So we have a youth leader at the area level. And then when you come to a district, the district is what I say that may comprise two, three, four, and sometimes even up to 10 churches. We have a youth leader. If you come to the local one church, we have a youth, a youth leader. So at the end of each year, the district pastor would call the youth leaders, meet with them. The youth leader will bring his plan. And when the plan is brought to the district pastor, he would include it into his annual uh, activities. When it comes to the area level, the area head, the superintendent, would also include it into his annual program. Then when it comes to the national level uh, and the, the general council level, I, the chairman, would also include it within that. So a week 
may be given to the youth to organize their programs. And if there's any other training and other things, to, opportunity will be given to them to, to do it. They have special uh, program of training youth to go out for evangelism. Um, so roughly, that is how the youth program is organized and also implemented. When the time is up, you, sure. you show it. Professor, yeah. you have shared much from your structure and organization. Can I ask a question regarding with the heart? Uh, because sometimes when we serve, there are times that we grow complacent. We are happy with where we are at and we, 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 we don't feel the need or the urge to grow bigger because, oh, it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be tiring. So I'm just happy to be here in my life group. I'm here happy to have my children's ministry. How do we overcome this kind of feeling. Even as pastors, sometimes we get into this situation where we are, we're just comfortable and let's just keep on doing the status quo. How do we, from your heart, how do you yeah. overcome this? You seem right. such a fire and a passion yes. to keep growing. Yeah. How do you sustain that? Yeah, so in other words, how do we overcome complacency? Yes. yes. Um, I started a church that we called International Worship Center in Accra, the capital city of Ghana. Um, I started that church because I realized that we were using the local languages to preach. And uh, we also started uh, using English. It is the legal, uh, lingua franca, the national uh, language for Ghana. But I realized that there were expatriates coming to the church in Ghana. And then uh, some people, because of globalization, their culture had changed. So they needed a different approach. So we started a church that we call International Worship Center, where the approach was multicultural approach. And the church started growing. It grew very fast, and people enjoyed themselves. But we realized that the place was full. And when we wanted to divide it, some of the people said, no, we enjoy ourselves. I mean, why should we divide the church? And um, we had to speak to them. Some of them were not happy at all. They were not happy. It, it, be, it became a, a point of conflict, the area head in charge. Because by that time, too, I had then been elected the chairman of the church. So the issue was brought to me. I had to get in to encourage them the importance of the division because they had been able to put up a church building somewhere else. And they didn't want another group to begin there. And when eventually they accepted the challenge and a session went there, the new one has become one of the biggest churches. I mean, I think now they should be the biggest one if you, in terms of one church. Uh, so usually there is that sort of complacency there is that source of complacency. But um, once the people manage and trust the senior pastor and his presbytery that yes, we think God is leading him and then follows his lead, they see signs of growth. And this time, they have understood the wisdom of the leadership because that has become, as I can say, the biggest church now they have become the biggest church now, getting to about 3,000 members, about 3,000. And when they went there, uh, when that church was divided, they were about 700. And that should be about um, seven years ago, six to seven years ago or so. And now they have grown to become, and the other one too has grown and filled the, the church building that they were in. Just about three weeks ago, they put in application to put up a dome type, a temporary shed that could accommodate them because they, had, they are now also getting to about 2,000 and, and in the center of Accra. So the key here too is trusting the lead of the spirit through the leadership so that you don't become complacent. <laughs> All right, yes. <laughs> All right, I think if you can give, uh, yeah, all right. 
happening is that the growth of Christianity in Ghana, as well as uh, Africa in general, because every time you hear, I don't know whether yes. rumors or what that, the growth of Christianity is growing there. A lot of people turning to Christianity. I wonder whether that is true or not. Either. Yes. Well, I better for you. To... All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's true that now Christianity is growing in Africa. If I take Ghana, for instance, um, our last census, the last census done by the government was 2010. 2010. Before that one, the, there was another one, I think, in uh, 1984. 1984, somewhere like that. And at that time, I think the Christianity, the, the percentage of Christianity of Ghana was about 62, 62. Now, with the one in 2010, Christianity has grown to be 70, almost 72%. Yeah, and this is government census. So that shows that Christianity is growing in the country. If you come to West Africa too, you see Christianity is growing southern part of Africa and eastern part of Africa. So Christianity is growing on the continent of Africa. Yeah, you see it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, any, yes. criteria or you can summarize to us uh, what sort of criteria you have to determine whether a church is growing or not yeah well within the church of Pentecost I'll give within the church of Pentecost and then I'll try to give uh, in Ghana as a whole within the church of Pentecost because we have an annual report where each local church district and area is supposed to present a report we know from the report whether the church is growing or not. You see from the membership. And once the, members, the membership increases, then also finance increases. It has bearings on, on the finances. So that one is very clear because the number increases and also finance also increases. And you realize the church is growing. Uh, I think for the Church of Pentecost, at the end of 2016, yeah, we are yet to present 2017 report. But with 2016, we had over about 200 people that were added into the church globally. Ghana alone was about 180,000. Globally, it was 200,000. Ghana alone, about 180, through the various reports. Now, if you come to Ghana, we've got a committee called Ghana Evangelism Committee that does a survey of Christian activities in the country. So the, the survey covers everything and tries to, tries to bring out the growth or otherwise of Christianity in the country and the rise of other religions. Um, and when that survey was taken, first in 87, then later in 91, in 87, it realized that the Church of Pentecost was the largest church so far as attendance was concerned in Ghana. Catholic was supposed to be the largest church, but when it came to church attendance, it was the Church of Pentecost. Um, last year, another one was conducted. It has not concluded, and it did it in the major churches. And then it realized that the Church of Pentecost was growing in numbers. So the survey helps us to know whether Christianity is growing. So it was realized that indeed Christianity was growing in the urban areas. There were few rural areas that did not have Christian churches. And when the survey comes out, then church leaders take the responsibility of trying to reach the unrich rural areas in the country. So thank you for that, yes. 
Okay, I think that's sufficient for tonight. Let's give a big hand to the Professor. Thank you very Thank you, much. Buddy. And I sense that there's some of us here tonight. We are just waiting for the circumstances to change, to become more favourable before we commit more of ourselves, before we step deeper into the water. But the Spirit of God say, no, you step in first. You step into the river first. Then I will make the river stop flowing. If the Church of Pentecost sat and waited for environments and circumstances to be better, they would not be where they are at today. There would be not so many souls being saved. Friends, I think so many times we deceive ourselves and waste so much time just waiting for circumstances to be more favourable before we step deeper in faith. I feel very strongly God's Spirit challenging us tonight. Don't wait. Don't wait. I'm leading you. Step in. And if this is you tonight, I just want you to stand to your feet at where you are at and make that place your altar, responding to the Lord. Say, Lord, I hear you. I will not wait for the circumstances, but I will trust you, trust you to grow in that ministry. Just stand to your feet very quickly at your place. Make that your altar. Hallelujah. Whether the situation is, is because of something at work, your family, your spouse, or even yourself, your health, your finances, say, Lord, I am not going to wait. Oh, Rabakashaya, Narabasanda, Rabahanda. Say, as you stand, say, Lord, Lord, here am I. Use me, Lord. Use me to grow and multiply the ministry. I want to see more children in the children's ministry. I want to see more being saved. I want to see the evangelism team growing and reaching more people and not just doing the status quo. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, church, there's nothing to be afraid. God knows what He's doing. It's only us who do not know what we are doing. Will you put your trust in God and stand and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for what you have done this evening. We are grateful that you have once again renewed our spirits. Once again, Lord, you are putting new thoughts into our minds that you may be glorified in us as individuals and for this church. Lord, yet yeah, this is just the beginning. It is the first of three days that we have set aside to do something in our lives. Lord, we are anticipating that what you have started today will snowball and at the end of these three days we will just be astounded at what you have done in our lives. And you will be taking this, Lord, so that your name will be glorified through us. Lord, thank you for your word through our senior pastor this last couple of weeks where he has been reminding us pastors and reminding us as a church that unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen watch in vain. And tonight, how wonderful it is you have reminded us of God that success comes not because of who we are and what structures we have, but Bishop has also said so clearly right from the beginning, it is the Spirit of the Lord. He is the Lord of the structures that will be successful. He is the Lord of every anointed individual who gives themselves to Him. So be glorified in us and be glorified through us. We love you, Father. And we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' most precious name we pray.